GSM hacking, access point stuff. Uh, but today he's, uh, he's going to talk about smart cards. So I'm going to hand the mic over to him. Take it away. Uh, thanks a lot, Carlos. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how this is going to work because this cable barely reaches over to this laptop, and I have to switch between all these. So, um, so if there's like big pauses where things just fall apart randomly, uh, please forgive me. Uh, my name is David Holton, uh, and I'm giving a talk on smart cards today. I'm a researcher with Doc Bowden Labs, just a small little group in San Diego, and I'm the chairman of TourCon, in case any of you have been there or heard of it. Uh, just as a disclaimer before we get started, uh, this is educational purposes only, all that crap. Uh, <laughs> curiosity, not fraud, all those ideals. Um, and full disclosure, I, all the information here I'm planning on releasing in a FRAC article, like in the next FRAC. Uh, because uh, I've got most of it done. If anybody wants a copy of it, just let me know, and I'll like give it to you later on, or something like that. But uh, yeah, all, all this information will be posted later. And um, <clears throat> this talk will cover, uh, give you a basic introduction to smart cards, basic technical knowledge of how smart cards work, how to analyze proprietary cards, uh, reverse engineer the protocols that they use, for both asynchronous and synchronous cards. And we're going to give an example with uh, GSM SIM cards and parking meter cards. And finally, show you methods on how to break it or you know, do naughty stuff. So what do we know about smart cards? There's this thing called the ISO 7816 standard that defines what a smart card is. And it's, it's a very loose standard. It basically just says, has a dur durability requirements, uh, pin layouts, and defines a little bit of the asynchronous protocols. For the durability requirements, it's really basic crap, like UV light protection and uh, electrical resistance and magnetic field resistance and stuff like that. And um, really boring stuff. The pin layout, though, uh, tells you exactly where all the pins should be. And so it just makes it so, you know, like all the smart cards have the right pinouts and all the readers have the right pinouts and stuff like that. And we're mainly going to be focusing on the reset pin the clock and the I.O. Those are the main, main ones that you want to know about. Uh, VCC is where all of your power comes into the card. And then there's uh, you know, the ground for zero voltage. And there's a couple of reserved pins that they don't really define. <coughs> so for asynchronous cards, what, uh, how they work is there's a couple of different protocols that they use. But um, mainly, it, it's just a, it acts as a serial device. And so you create. 9600 baud connection to the device, and then you can do challenge response sort of stuff. And um, it's very common with processor cards. With synchronous cards, uh, they're mainly used for memory cards, and so it's really simple logic. The the cards don't even have like their own internal clock, and so it's all supplied by the reader. So first, I'm going to talk about asynchronous cards. Asynchronous cards are usually um, any type of processor card, so uh, GSM SIM cards, bank cards. PKI token cards, Java cards, um, ones that are a little bit more complex and actually have challenge response to them. And um, synchronous protocol, yeah, just use uh, IO pin to create a 9600 baud connection. And when the reset is set to high, it tells it to reset the card. And then you can just send simple commands. Um, with AP, APDU commands, you just have four bytes for your command on there. And uh, one byte for the length, and then you can throw on arguments to whatever command you're sending to it. And then you receive a standard response back. So how, how um, SIM cards work in phones is uh, we're, we're mainly going to be looking at the KI on the cards, like the ESN, um, basically the key on your SIM card that identifies you on the network. And how this whole thing works is Let's say you want your phone to connect up to a GSM base station. You uh, say, hey, base station, can I connect to you? Uh, this is my identifier. And then the base station's like, oh, well, uh, here's a challenge. If you are actually who you say you are, you can provide me with the right response. And so what it does is it relays this challenge onto Comp128 on the SIM card. And whatever response it gets, it sends back to the base station, basically. And um, 
Actually, Comp 128 is also used uh, for seeding, like all the data, encrypt data encryption, the voice communication encryption, stuff like that. So um, they really try, try really hard to protect KI and make sure people can't get that. Different attacks on Comp 128. Um, there's a narrow pipe collision attack that Ian Goldberg, uh, David Wagner, and Mike, Mark Persano found out. And there's also a side channel attack that uses DPA to try and find KI. And if you can actually get the KI on the SIM card, what does it get you? You can clone phones, eavesdrop on calls, uh, do fun stuff like that. And the only downside is it attacks the SIM card. So you actually have to have the person's physical SIM card to perform this attack. And there's a possibility of killing the card. So there's some, some risks involved. In, in this presentation, I'm going to be doing a bunch of demonstrations and showing you how to use tools to interface with the cards and stuff. So uh, in, in this, this demonstration, I'm using a Taui Toco chip drive micro 130. It's just a USB um, smart card reader. You can buy them for about like 50 bucks online. And I just like it because there's, there's really good software for it. And it works for virtually all the, all the types of memory cards and stuff. And um, how you can interface with SIM cards is uh, you just use standard a APDU um, interfaces. Uh, with, the, with the libraries that they provide you, you can, you can easily uh, write software to interface with it really well. Um, I just wrote a really simple command line app that you know, is really easy to interface with it. And I'm going to be demonstrating that in a couple minutes. Uh, you can also use a dumb mouse. It's really, lots of people use this. Uh, all it does is it just ties your uh, serial port over to the card and so you can just you know, create a serial connection and talk to it directly that way. And there's really good software for it that you can grab from ftp.ccc.de slash gsm. And uh, not too many people know about it, but there's lots of really good resources in there. And also, uh, you could use a season, which is basically the same thing as a dumb mouse. Well, you can use it for tapping as well. And you can get schematics on that from FRAC 6215. So uh, in this demonstration, I'm just going to connect to the card by inserting the card. And then uh, I'm going to select the GSM directory on the card, authenticate with the PIN, and run COMP128. So just a minute. Ah, it partially works. You can get a holder for your SIM card that allows you to put it in a smart card reader. And uh, you can buy these for like two bucks online or something like that. <laughs> Does Bodo have them? Oh, Bodo sells readers. It's actually, um, for people that have really good questions at the end, Bodo gave me some smart card readers that I'm going to give away. So uh, stick around. Uh, OK, so first I'm going to reset the card, just uh, typing an R. And uh, hopefully this will work. I'm going to issue a command to select the uh, GSM directory. Uh, and so then I get this response back from the card, and uh, it's supposed to mean it's OK. Uh, there's, there's been a bunch of stuff published. Like if you read the FRAC article, they have uh, um, the guy published like a bunch of the different directories that are on there. So, so. The yeah, yeah, like all, all the SIM cards have this one. Um, and then there's different directories you can use for pulling down contact info, you know, contacts and uh, SMS stuff or whatever, whatever else is stored on there. So yeah, read uh, FRAC 62. It has all the info on there. And so now this, this command uh, tells it to pull down 19 bytes from the result. And so this is a uh, um, info from the GSM directory. But now that we're in there, I'm going to authenticate with the pin. 
This is exactly what your phone does whenever you power it on and ask for the pin. Uh, oops. And this is actually uh, Carlos's old SIM card. So if you look at this enough, you can find out what his pin is. He probably uses it on his current cell phone, too. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, if you look closely on there, it says 3839, 3839, and then a bunch of Fs. And that means that if you uh, look at it in ASCII, then you'll know what his uh, pin is. Um, so we're authenticated, and uh, now I'm going to run Comp128 on the card. And I'm just going to feed a bunch of zeros, just for an example. So there's uh, 12 bytes of response. Uh, I'm going to grab that. Uh, let's see. And uh, there's a response from Comp128. And so uh, that's how you can use to pull COMP120 on the card. So now, now that we have an interface to getting a COMP128, I'm going to uh, show you how COMP128 works. Oh, and by the way, thanks to uh, CCC and Ender for providing lots of info about uh, the GSIMSIM cards. So there's a the demonstration. And uh, if, you don't, if you happen to not know the protocol that the things are using, you can always uh, make your own by reading FRAC 62 or by a season, which you can grab from SD Logic. And they're actually, um, uh, they've actually been involved in lawsuits with PrimeStar and DirecTV, as uh, you might have heard from the talk earlier. So uh, if you buy something from there, then just be aware that they might try and sue you or something. But you can use that to log the connection and figure out the protocol. Now, uh, I'm just going to cover the narrow pipe collision attack. How, how, do you, how do you perform this attack? Ian Goldberg found that uh, there's a narrow pipe in Comp 128, and uh, he attacks the second round. Collisions in Comp 128 responses reveal key information. And you can crack Comp 128 using his method in about 115,000 queries, according to uh, his article. Unfortunately, new SIM cards will die after 65,000 queries. It's a new feature that they added in. And so, uh, <laughs> so most people won't be able to get to you know, 115,000 and actually crack it. So I've been working on optimizations to speed this up to make it a little bit faster. Um, this is what Comp128 looks like. It's all like pseudocode and stuff. So I don't expect you to read it or understand it. But um, uh, the cool thing is that at the very end, they null padded 10 bits at the end. And uh, they think that it's because of the NSA just added in their own little feature to Comp128. But um, it basically essentially reduces your uh, voice security with your cell phone by 10 bits. So thanks, NSA. <coughs> uh, just the algorithms used in the US. Does that, does that counter, the 65K counter, does that get reset? Or does that, like, for the life of the card? Um, it's for the life of the card. So, like every time you power on your phone, associate with the base station and stuff like that, it uses you know text down the counter once, and so they they assume that you aren't going to be using it 65,000 times, and you'll upgrade in like a couple years or something like that. So, uh, Comp 128 for dummies. Uh, what happens is you know how I showed you uh, feeding a challenge to Comp 128 when we interface with it. What happens is there's this X array in the COMP128 function that uh, loads the secret key into the first 16 bytes. And then it takes the challenge and stuffs it in the next 16 bytes. And then it goes through this bit reduction routine I'm going to cover right now. So for example, if you have a key that's all zeros and a challenge that's all zeros, what happens is in this bit reduction, it ends up uh, performing operations on like the zero bit or zero byte and uh, the 16th byte and uh, uses both of those as inputs and then spits out uh, results into those. And so it just performs operations on those and goes along until it's gone through every one, you know, at offset 16 for round one. 
Then in round two, it uses an offset of eight and uh, does the same thing, only it reduces by seven bits and it uses lookup tables and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to learn more, just look into it, but um, I'm just kind of skimming through this. So in round two, it goes through um, and performs operations on all those and reduces them down to seven bits for each byte. In round three, it uh, does the same thing with offset four, it reduces them down to six bits. Uh, round four does it with offset two, reduces them to five bits. And then in round five, it reduces them down to four, all the way through. And essentially what Comp128 does is it's, it's just like a checksum. It basically makes all the bytes dependent on each other. So if any byte changes, uh, the result is supposed to change. And uh, then it takes all those four-bit values, shifts them over, uh, makes them like puts them at the end of X, and then uh, feeds K back, KI back into the beginning, and then repeats it seven times. And so it iterates quite a lot. Then it uh, reduces bytes, null pads to ten bits, and uh, returns. <coughs> so how this baseline attack works is, if we look for different challenges, it end up with, you know, giving us the same response. Uh, and just like kind of drill it down in the algorithm. Uh, in this example, I'm using this key, which is you know one two three four five six seven eight nine and so on. And uh, if you look at challenge at a challenge where it's twenty three a bunch of zeros and then five five a bunch of zeros, and uh, zero d a bunch of zeros and uh, e seven a bunch of zeros. In round one, you'll notice that uh, of course there's going to be different values when it performs operations on the on the first byte. But uh, all these other ones end up being the same because it's virtually the same uh, same function that's going on there. And then it goes on, and uh, you notice that all of these are, are the same except for you know ones that offset zero and ones that offset eight. In the second round, look at that. It just happens to swap them with uh, the exact same values. And so now we have uh, all the same values in the very top row. And then it goes through to the, the bottom row and swaps them with the same values down there. And so uh, once we get to that point, it'll end up having the exact same response. The cool thing about this property is that we, now we know that if we run Comp128 with a challenge of 2, 3, a bunch of zeros, and 5, 5, a bunch of zeros, it ends up with the same result as 0D, uh, a bunch of zeros, E7, a bunch of zeros. And we know that uh, uh, the keys in the byte are 0, 1, and something, and then FE and something. And so we've just retrieved two bytes of the key. Then you can just repeat it eight times, and you have the whole key. So I, I was looking at trying to speed this up a little bit. And um, I tried uh, you know, brute forcing all the different collisions and finding the collisions that happen the most often, and then just choosing those first and uh, optimizing it that way. And it makes, it makes it a bit faster, but it still isn't fast enough. So one thing you can do is you can attack the third round. And because you already have some pieces of the puzzle for the third round, you can um, find certain collisions that uh, reveal like single bytes. And so instead of attacking two bytes at a time and brute forcing 16 bits, you can virtually brute force one byte at a time. And so it, it reduces the, um, you know, like the complexity a lot. The only problem is that you have to, uh, to pre-compute everything. And it takes a lot, a lot of uh, pre-computation. So you can do that with the third round to retrieve two bytes. Then in the fourth round, you can retrieve four more. And then in the fifth round, you can retrieve the rest of them. And uh, it's owned in less than 20,000 tries. So this works with most GSM carriers in the US, like T-Mobile, Singular, et cetera. And um, the new attack, new attack takes around 15 minutes with a pre-computed dictionary. And um, so I, I haven't totally Compute it like what the full dictionary is going to be, but um, it should be it shouldn't be that bad. And uh, once you have KI, you can emulate SIM card really easily with a pick. There's all kinds of code out there for doing it, uh, gold wafer cards, stuff like that. And um, I'm going to release some open source tools pretty shortly. You can also download SimScan, which implements this. And um, I think he's had it out for a little while, so uh, check that out. Uh, any questions so far on the GSM stuff? <laughs> no. Uh, I think that Boost Mobile uses something totally different. They, I, I'm pretty sure that they don't use uh, GSM SIM cards. Or, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I don't think it'll work with Boost. 
Uh, any other quick questions? Yeah. Have you tried this on a card from a non-US GS No, I haven't. Um, they use, uh, they have three different types of uh, encryption types you can use for it. There's uh, one which is no encryption, which is really useful. Um, <laughs> there's another one that's, uh, you know, like US, and then there's one they use in Europe, I think. There might be another one, I'm not sure. But uh, anything else? Or, yeah. Oh no, it's just it's just for GSM, just GSM SIM cards. Uh, anything else? Uh, oh yeah. Uh huh. Uh yeah yeah. Um, it's actually kind of weird because they end up shaving off uh, a lot of stuff when they um like when they uh, uh put together the response at the end. Because it's only 12 bytes of response, and you know you're feeding a lot of input to it. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I found that there's uh, there's some collisions that end up doing that, and so um, yeah, uh, I what I ended up doing was I just go through the algorithm and um, and uh, basically like find a, a right equation that makes it line up. And so it's more kind of like uh, making it line up in the second round than actually running it through and brute forcing everything. And so it's a little more accurate if you do it that way. Um, I don't know, we could talk later or something. Yeah, anything else? Oh. Uh, what was that again? Uh, what, what was that? Oh, okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, he said that, that there's a fourth one that nobody can crack, and so that's why nobody uses it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and there's, there's some really good candidates for the new GSM uh, encryption algorithms. So, uh, is that it? Uh, yeah, we'll have more time for questions later. So moving on to parking meters. Uh, what the fuck is a parking meter? Um, basic intro to parking meters. These are the types of parking meters we have in San Diego. There is a coin input, a coin output, which is very useful, and uh, an input for a smart card. Now, if you look at the smart card, uh, I have a couple right here. They're just real simple SIM card, uh, yeah, smart cards. And um, what they say on the back is parking meter debit card. Insert debit card into meter in direction shown by arrow. The meter will increment in six minute segments. And actually, it's down to four minute segments because they just raised the prices in San Diego. Uh, when desired time is displayed, remove card. Did you buy too much time? To obtain extra time, refund. Uh, insert the same debit card that was used to purchase time in the meter. Full six minute increments will be create, credited to the card. Increments of less than six minutes will be lost. And so there, there is a way to refund credits onto the card. And that's one important piece of information to know. Uh, these, these cards are synchronous smart cards, and they're, they're just like memory cards, uh, just like Kinko's cards, uh, Internet Cafe cards, cash cards. Um. And synchronous protocol is uh, very, very simple. The clock sets uh, the transfer speed. And so the reader just uh, kind of moves the clock up and down from 5 volts to 0 and um, uses that to, to create the clock for the, the actual card. And uh, if the reader wants to start reading information, it just sets the reset high to tell the card to reset, and then uh, starts ticking the clock. And for each time that the clock goes high, uh, the card will see that the clock's high, and so it'll set uh, the data line to whatever the bit is. And so, like for the first time the clock goes high, uh, the card will set, you know, like uh, set the I/O line to whatever bit zero is, and then the second time it goes high, it'll set the I/O line to whatever uh, bit one is, and uh, just keep on going until the whole card is dumped. Parking meter cards are very similar to like European telecom cards that are actually covered in FRAC 48. And I have one here. And so you can use these in, in Europe to like pay for uh, pay phones and stuff. And how these work is they implement a one-way counter. And uh, basically what happens is in the factory they set exactly how many credits the card is supposed to have. So uh, let's say the card's only supposed to have like $50 on it. They set that amount of bits on the card, and uh, then they blow a fuse, and then from then on, uh, the bits can only go from one to zero. 
And so that's supposed to provide security that you don't uh, you know, put bits back onto the card somehow or reprogram them. And uh, I'm just going to do a quick demonstration of reading some cards so you can kind of see what it looks like on them. There's this really nice tool that comes with the Taui Toko reader for reading stuff. It's kind of hard to find now because I think they took it off the website, but you can find it on the German site. Uh, no, no. <laughs> okay, so this is this is a European telecom card, and uh, they actually use um, they're actually able to round uh, the bit deductions or something like that. So there's there's a lot less stuff on here. That's all the data on there. If you look at uh, parking meter card, you get a lot more info on here. And so there's there's all these kind of like empty spaces and full spaces of bits and stuff. So I'll be covering that a little bit later, but. You can just drop in any memory card that you have. Like this is a Kinko uh, Express Pay card. I haven't looked at these too much, so if anybody looks into these much, uh, it's kind of interesting. There's like it says Cash Customer down here, and uh, I don't know different things. Uh, and uh, these types of cards actually use a pin for read writing to them. And so if you can figure out the pin, then you can rewrite stuff on the cards, or you can just get your own or whatever, or emulate your own. But um, if you guys have any interesting cards, uh, let me know later on, because I always like to look at new stuff. Uh, okay, so from a parking meter card memory dump, uh, we get something like this. Uh, through trial and error, I kind of figured out um, on, on most memory cards, the first four bytes is an ATR, answer to reset. And it's just kind of like a serial number. And then there's another four bytes of another type of serial number. And um, what I found out is that if you look at the green portion over there, that's actually uh, the area for credit bits. And so for every bit that's set in there, it means 10 cents on the card. And if you look at the blue portion, that's the refund bits area. Because they can only go from uh, one bits to zero bits, they uh, decided to have a separate section just for refunds. So for every bit that's set to zero in that area, you get a refund on the card. And how it works is, um, is like, let's say you uh, have a bunch of refunds, but you use up all your credit bits. You know, what, hap what do you do then? They have uh, this refund buffer area that's only for about maybe $5. And so you can really only refund $5 and actually use it. Um, so it's kind of, it seems kind of pointless to refund a bunch of credits when you can't, you can only use like five extra dollars. So on this particular card, there's six bits for credits plus uh, seven bits for refund, so it ends up being like $1.30. Now, if you want to figure out how they you know, increment credits and deduct credits, you'll have to somehow reverse engineer the protocol by tapping it or guessing or something like that. So the um, uh, basic method is to somehow tap the connection, log the data, and decode the protocol. Now. Um, you can, you can buy lots of tappers for asynchronous cards, like uh, have this one right here that like Prime Star can sue you for having. And, um, and these things are great. They just have a serial interface. You can listen to communication. But I, I can't find anything that's uh, made for synchronous stuff. And so I, I, know, I don't know anything about electronics, but um, uh, with a friend of mine, we ended up developing this, this thing. Uh, it's attached onto the back of this laptop. It's really ghetto. Uh, the, uh, made like a fake smart card. I'm not sure if you can see this, but um, it's actually a Pete's coffee card. I put copper tape on, and it's soldered onto a ripped up uh, floppy drive cable. And it's run over to this uh, smart card socket that I ripped off of an old smart card reader that I had laying around. And uh, that goes back to, um, and then I end up using uh, like one of these floppy drive cable thingies. Uh, it has vampire clips on it to tap the connection. And um, that runs back to, 
uh, 10k resistors, it goes to a buffer, it goes to the par parallel port so you can monitor the lines. And in the FRAC article, I have lots of cool ASCII art, so uh, this is like the basic schematics for it if you want to make your own. And with logging the data, you just uh, pull the parallel port I.O. and uh, you can find all kinds of information on dealing with the parallel port uh, online. And if the I.O. lines change, just log it to memory and then once you're done, just save it to a file. I had the, the really bad idea of just printing it out and this stuff goes so fast that I was just losing bits left and right, so uh, a lot of trial and error getting that to work. But um, yeah, it's really simple code for doing that. And um, decoding the protocol. I just wrote this really simple program for uh, decoding bytes from the stream that you get, and, um, and then also doing time graph analysis. So here's a quick demonstration of that. <laughs> okay, a little better. <laughs> Present for the DEF CON staff. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna There it goes. Okay, so I'm just I'm going to tap the connection between uh, this this parking meter card and uh, my smart card reader over here. I wasn't able to bring a real parking meter out here. I'm sorry, guys, but it's just uh, it's too heavy. What's that? <laughs> oh. Okay, so I'm gonna. I just inserted in my fake card into the reader, and so it's doing its thing. And I'm gonna pull it out. Cancel it. Uh, oops. Spacebar doesn't work that well. So I just log I just log the bits to the file and um, it's not not too pleasant to deal with this stuff, so uh, you can pipe it through here. Uh, and here's uh, some of the data that's pulling down. It does all kinds of crazy stuff, uh, but kind of gives you an idea for um, for what sort of uh, information it's getting. Uh, the core stuff, though, is uh, doing time graph analysis because that's when you can really figure out the protocols a little bit better. And I got this on the other machine. <laughs> and so you can you can feed into um, a script that we put together that just uh, graphs it out. So you can kind of see, okay, here's some bits that have been going along. Uh, the clock is on the bottom. The reset is actually inverted, and it's kind of weird on here, but the reset's up on the top, uh, second to top. And then uh, the I-line's at the very top. So you can see there's some data there. And then just as it stays high. Um, 
and uh, goes low for all of our credit bits, then goes high again, and uh, goes along, goes along, and then it resets and reads it again. It does this a lot, and reads it like maybe about half a dozen times or so. And actually, like this area right here is where it actually writes to the card and um, deducts or increments credits and stuff. And I ha kind of have it explained a little bit better in the slides. But uh, in memory dump, you kind of see you know, like the IO line going up and down and stuff. And, uh, and then with the write to the card, it does this, this weird sequence. And so it's just like how the protocol works. But uh, for deduct, it ends up having this sort of pattern to it. And um, it resets a couple times. And it actually uses one of the reserved lines to uh, do this. So uh, you have to account for that when you're emulating it or whatever, or tapping it. And for a refund, it ends up doing something like this. And so you can, you can do the same thing to the card to refund a bunch of bits if you want. But uh, what I've been working on is emulating this, this, the uh, parking meter cards. So you, know, you can just walk up with a card and uh, you know, insert it with $50 or whatever, and it ducks some amount. And um, I, I just don't like dealing with EEPROM and stuff that saves to the card, so I just make it forget the credits and you know, go back to 50 the next time you insert it. <laughs> um, and so that, that'll, that'll probably, the code for that will be, I'll, I'll release it pretty soon. I'm just, it's been hard to test it out here without a parking meter. Um, yeah, look for frac, look at uh, frac 48.11 for hints. I'm using a 16F84A, those are pretty popular right now. And um, just make sure you supply a clock, and a uh, good tip is to tie the clock line to interrupt. Um, yeah, so I'll have full code and semantics pretty soon. See me for details if you want any sneak peeks or anything. And uh, brute force. This is a really cool thing that I, I found out when I was uh, <laughs> messing with them. And, I, I was like struggling on this stuff for a couple months, and then I just tried this thing out when I, like, out of accident. And you just fold a business card in half, stick it in. It's not a valid smart card, so it goes out of order. And um, and if you fold a business card in half, it's the perfect size where it's hard to pull out. And so and people barely even notice that it's in there. And so if it's out of out of order, you can just park there forever until they figure it out. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> yeah, and then just like use a credit card or something to pull it out later. <laughs> and uh, other memory cards, like I said, with the pins and stuff. Uh, the, a, lot, a lot of the stuff is just security through obscurity. They have they figure that if they make a weird protocol, nobody's going to figure it out. So. Um, like a, I, I have this friend in, um, in Holland that was auditing some university soda machines because lots of universities use cards for credits for students and stuff. And um, it turned out that every card had a different pin for uh, enabling read-write on it. And uh, what they ended up doing was they thought, oh, well, we'll have a different pin on each card. So it's, if somebody gets one card, then you know, they can't unlock all of them. And, um, so what they did was they just had a bunch of garbage data on the card. And they do something like, uh, byte 6 plus byte 8 minus like byte 42 divided by some other byte equals you know whatever the pin is and so the the soda machine would know this sort of algorithm it would read the card data in and figure out the pin and then use that to unlock it to rewrite the credits on the card and um, and so I mean like you can uh, easily defeat this stuff uh, Michael Stegen actually uh, ended up coding a pick to just uh, emulate the card, and then when it receives the pin, it just saves it to another portion of memory on there. And so, uh, you know, you stick in the in the machine, and it it's an, it uh, unlocks the card and thinks that everything's fine, deducts the credits, and then you just take the card, stick it in your machine, and uh, you can see what the pin is because it just writes it right there. And um, there, there's all kinds of ways of getting around it, and it's just security through obscurity. But most of the time, it seems that people just use the same pin on every card. So if you can tap the connection, you can figure out the pin, um, and then just you know have fun rewriting all their cards. So yeah, conclusions. Um, that's how you can reach me if you want want to email me any, anything, ask me any questions, and uh, some references. Really great stuff. Uh, shameful plugs. Come to TourCon, please, if you if you're able to make it out, and. Uh, 
I'm going to be at ShmooCon, so if you want to go there, and uh, I think Layer 1's going on again next year, so um, some good conferences. I'd like to support the small ones. And uh, questions, suggestions, who wants a free smart card reader? Uh, <laughs> wow. You, did, you guys didn't respond too well to the question suggestions, but I mean. <laughs> What's that? Oh, OK. All right. Do you have any questions? Uh, are you going to give me the cards? Yeah. <laughs> Where are those smart cards? Uh, oh, they're like a mag start? What's that? What's that? Uh, I don't know. It's it's probably a processor Bart. card or something. What? what about Bart oh, Bart card. <laughs> no, I don't have a mag stripe reader. Uh, what's that? Huh? I like to take a look. Oh yeah, it doesn't have. Does it have a have the pinouts on it? Like, like how it has like some gold at the top? No. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, you have a question? What the cards or the readers? Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I've, I've heard about this. He, he was saying how um, credit card companies are starting to distribute uh, smart card readers and stuff. And um, I think that they, they use it for like authentication with their websites and things like that. And so yeah, totally. Um, if you uh, you could try and tap the connection and figure out how they talk to each other and and uh, try some attacks on there. But uh, I haven't looked at them personally. What's that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's plenty of drivers out there for Gem Plus readers, but I, I couldn't find anything for these, so <laughs> good luck. Uh, but you can have one if you want. Uh, I'll just leave it here for you or something. Um, anybody else? Uh, what's that? Oh, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah you, de you deserve one. What's up? Uh, I'm not quite sure. I think it. I think it might be for timing reasons or something like that. They were just kind of lazy, and they, you know, it, when you when you stick the the card into the meter, it ends up flashing, um, you know, the credits on the card, and then it starts slowly counting it down and stuff. And so uh, it might have been some sort of timing weird thing, or uh, or maybe they just wanted to verify that you know the data was there and there was any corruption in the line or something like that. That's what, that's my only guess. Uh, somebody over here. Yeah, I know. I know some people. Or he was saying that um, uh, he was wondering if any cards, uh, any people have been actually disassembling the cards to read directly from the flash. And uh, I know that, that some people were, were using like electron microscopes and stuff like that, using acid to burn away the the plastic and stuff. But um, you know, it's just it takes a lot of equipment and it's really difficult. So, but yeah, people are people have been working on that. Uh, so yeah, you you can have one of these and you can have one of these if you want. Uh, yeah. Uh, timing attacks? Yeah, for, for attacking GSM, the side channel attack actually um, analyzes the amount of power it's sucking. And so uh, what it uses, uh, it turns out that when it's um, computing stuff, there's a table in there that's um, actually 512 bytes. And it, it can only do eight bits at a time. And so they split it up into two tables. And there's a noticeable um, power drain when it reads from one table to the other. And, uh, and so they use something like that to, to do it. I, I'm not too, totally sure about timing attacks, but um, people are definitely working on like side channel attacks like that. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, programming for oh how do they reprogram them for for stuff like that I oh I don't know I'm 
I'm thinking that they might interface with uh, some sort of smart card or, or um, I, yeah, I have no idea. Um, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm guessing that if everybody's, everybody ends up uh, making these cards that get you free parking, they'll end up having to upgrade all of them or something like that, so we can find out then. What's that? Oh, are they? Oh, okay. What, before or after, like? <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, yeah. You. Have you looked at the Java cards? The, the, the military cards, what they're using in things like Department of Homeland Security and all those things there. Yeah. And I was wondering if you're able to actually pull down some of their, uh, their little programs that they install on them or be able to manipulate those or even a couple of new programs that would fool other type of, uh, when they put their card back in. Yes, it's put a Trojan horse on their card. Right. Yeah, he he was saying that um, a lot of places are using like Java cards and stuff like that, and so you might be able to reprogram them. And uh, yeah, like the the stuff that I've been dealing with, it, you can't reprogram them. It's all like hard coded in the chip. But um, I know that uh, like uh, Bruce Potter and uh, some other people have been working on the Java card stuff. And there's definitely like all kinds of cool attacks you can do with those. Um, do do you say that the military IDs you, do you use Java cards? Oh, okay. Well. Oh, okay. Yeah, it'd be interesting to look at. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, the PUK for SIM cards? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know how you'd, how you'd get that because... Uh, yeah, I, I haven't looked at any of the tax when getting the pins or the PUK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can emulate the card once you have once you have the key, so you don't have to worry about that stuff once you get there. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting if there somebody found some attacks on getting that. Um, yeah, go ahead. With, with these uh, stored value cards, is there? A, I assume that these meters, um, obviously, they're sold in multiple cities. What's to stop you from, say, taking a card from? San Diego and one up to say Boston, but they use the same meters up there. If you were to stick in there, would it still work? Um, yeah, I don't know. I I noticed that all of them have um, have serial numbers and stuff like that, and so there might be some sort of algorithm for verifying that um, it's like a valid card. And yeah, they might have something like that, and so um, in that case, then if you use a, you know like an emulator or something like that, you just have to reprogram that. And, I would think that it would work. Uh, I noticed that there's there's just a couple parking meter uh, manufacturers that are doing this kind of stuff, and so it's probably really similar between the different cities. Uh, go ahead. So with all these, uh, the more popular gets the more exploits there are. Do you think that uh, companies and industry in general will continue to adopt smart card technology to various types, or do you think that it's going to go towards something like RFID? Um, I I don't know. It seems like smart cards are pretty popular right now, and it seems like RFIDs are too. Uh, but I uh, I don't know. Um, there there's definitely a lot of stuff people are doing with uh, smart cards nowadays, and like with Java cards and um, and making things uh, a lot more secure, you know, like with PKI and uh, stuff like that. So um, and it, it seems like like RFIDs are pretty new, and so there isn't a whole lot of security in them yet. So I don't know. It it really depends. Um, I like the manufacturing costs and stuff like that, I guess. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, way back there. No, I no, I don't, but I, I live in downtown San Diego, so I, it's like right out my door. That's a question. <laughs> oh, he, he, was, he was asking if I actually own a parking meter or possess one. <laughs> yeah, we were thinking of using our friend's Hummer and tying it to the back or something. But. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, just uh, a couple more questions. Uh, Jay? Yeah. Oh, um, to the GSM attacks? Or Um, I don't know. Uh, somebody from Europe like mailed me the other, emailed me the other day asking about it, and uh, I, don't know, I think that they're 
they're definitely doing a lot of stuff to um, to roll out new algorithms. Like I know Qualcomm has uh, just published uh, Silver 128. That's supposed to be like the new candidate for uh, new uh, GSM stuff. Um, there, there seems like there's all kinds of open source candidates out there. So I don't think they're too concerned about um, about stuff right now. But they're they're definitely do, using a lot of planning to just fix things and start over properly. And so, uh, yeah, one more. Uh, Um, yeah, I tried that, but um, you actually need that extra reserved pin that I was talking about. Uh, if uh, if it doesn't have the right logic on that pin, then it just doesn't work, and there aren't really any other memory cards that use any of those pins. And so, uh, yeah, I definitely tried that because I have I have a couple different blank cards here that I was using, and um, and they definitely are able to distinguish between um, the correct ones and you know like ones you're copying. And okay, I guess that's it for today. Um, thanks a lot. If you have any other questions, uh, feel free to walk up to me later.